All right, so now that we know how streams work, I think it's really important that we talk about how humans are screwing that up because, um, yeah, it's obviously a huge problem. Now, when we think about um, where we need to like protect ecosystems, we really should be spending most of our time thinking about biodiversity hotspots, right? But while Wisconsin is great, we don't have that much biodiversity, right? We don't really have um, endemic species that are only found here in Wisconsin. Pretty much everything we find in Wisconsin, we can find in Canada, we can find in Michigan, we can find in Minnesota. So it's not that super important. What the, the biggest by far instance in terms of terrestrial ecosystems of where we're seeing extinctions happen is in tropical forests, all right? We're losing 4% of the species in tropical forests every decade, and that's huge amounts, right? Now, but when we look at um, the extinction rates in, um, so they, these data are looking at just fish species, and we've, since 1900, in North America, we've had 123, I think it's fish and mussels. Um, looking at, we've seen 123 extinctions, okay? And if you look at that, because it's, um, well, it's only 123 species, which in itself is a problem, yes, but um, is not that many total species for a whole continent. Um, we're at that, high 3.8, 3.9%. So, you know, we're losing a lot of, of species in aquatic systems. So there's like a lot of arguments made that we should really be protecting aquatic systems more than terrestrial ecosystems. And if we look at, these are species lists, um, or aquatic species lists by like different groups. And what we see is, um, you know, these are, this would, vulnerable kind of means would be like a threatened species, imperiled is endangered, critically imperiled means like really, really endangered, only a few species or a few individuals left, and then extinct, right? And we see that 69% of mussels, this is in, these are all North American numbers, are um, in some way threatened with extinction. Um, and if you look here, all of these are from here up are all freshwater. And then we get down to dragonflies and damselflies. These are also freshwater, right? So a lot of these species on this list, especially the ones with the highest numbers, are really um, tied to aquatic systems. Um, there's plenty of rivers that um, are just not flowing anymore. And these, are, this is a list of rivers that no longer flow to the ocean. The Colorado River um, basically used to all the time go through Mexico into um, flow into Baja California. It does not do that anymore. Very rarely, occasionally it does if there's a big flood, but most of the time it dries up before it even gets there because there's been so much water extraction. And this is really common with um, rivers that are flowing through more arid areas. So a decent number of rivers in Australia and India and that kind of thing are not going to the uh, ocean anymore. Um, the next biggest thing that I want to talk about that humans are doing to rivers is dams. Okay, the U.S. has lots and lots of dams, right? Um, in the lower 48 states, there's only 42 what we call high quality river sections that have at least 200 kilometers without a dam. Now that does not mean there is no dam on the river at all, it just means there's at least 200 kilometers. And what we see is pretty much every single river that we have has a dam on it. And really this is common across Europe, across North America, and uh, the former USSR, right? Russia put on, the Russia, US, Canada, Europe has put a dam essentially on every large river. We're not building as many dams anymore. Not really because we, you know, know it's bad for some reason. It's that we just don't really have any good spots to put dams anymore. All the rivers have been dammed and I, I guess we are starting to realize the consequences a little bit, but 
um, really that's a secondary reason why we're not building dams anymore. So what about a good a dam? Is it good? Is it bad? Well, um, hydropower, right? Hydroelectricity is maybe one of the first things we think about, but it's really not the most common reason that we make dams. The two most common reasons we make dams are for water storage and for flood control. So the big reservoirs in the Missouri River Basin, so the Fort Peck, the Garrison, the Oahe, the Big Bend, and the Gavin's Point Dam, well, Fort Randall too, these are uh, a bunch of different reservoirs. These prevent floods from flooding basically Kansas City, St. Louis, the big cities down south. Um, they're giant reservoirs that travel for hundreds of miles that um, really allow, so like when snow melts in the spring and if you get, get some thunderstorms or particularly a raining area, the Missouri River will oftentimes flood. We've built these huge dams that can hold a lot of water and then you will, the peak won't be as much. You'll have um, like a longer, they will flatten out the curve basically of not a big peak in flow, but a longer, more extended period of higher flow, but that's not as high, so you won't get as much floods. And um, then water storage. So a lot of places that have not super accessible groundwater um, are using surface water for their, um, their drinking water. So California, you, most of their water that they get to drink is from surface water, and this is in 2015 when they had a big drought and this is one of their big reservoirs that you can imagine used to be filled up up to here and is now really low. Um, and they're actually projected this year in 2020 to um, have a pretty decent drought over the summer because there was um, not a rainy winter. Um, so water storage and flood control, the two biggest reasons we make dams, but then also navigation, right? So the Mississippi River from pretty much middle, well, from Minneapolis-St. Paul all the way down to New Orleans is really um, regulated so that barges can go up and down the river. So we can move our grain, we can move our oil, we can move our corn around the country with, with ease. And then hydroelectricity, um, depending on where you are, so Iceland builds a lot of hydropower dams. They're 80% powered by hydropower. Norway is majority hydropower, some nuclear energy. But um, a lot of the Scandinavian countries do use a lot of hydropower. And um, so there are some good things with dams, right? The thing is, when you make a dam, what you're doing is you're limiting the ability of the river to fertilize the land that it is, right? So the Red River of the North that goes through Minnesota and North Dakota is really fertilizing that land to make it very nice farmland. This is one of the reasons why, you know, the ancient Egyptians went along the Nile because that land was extremely productive due to all the fertilization that the river itself did. The thing is, when you disconnect a river from its floodplain, what you do is you get rid of that natural fertilization, so then you need to put fertilizer on your land. Now, where do we get our fertilizer? We get our fertilizer from the this thing called the Haber process, which takes it's essentially artificial nitrogen fixation. And if you know anything, remember when we were talking about that um, diatomic nitrogen, having that triple covalent bond is very hard to break. The Haber process takes a lot of energy. It essentially takes a ton of electricity to do. So this, I think, is pretty interesting statistic that 20% of the electricity generated in a given hydropower dam is then used to make the fertilizer that would replace that natural nutrients that are deposited on the system. So a lot of people come in and say, hey, we're gonna make you know, X amount of hydropower. That's great, but we really then need to get power from other sources to be able to power the Haber process to fix the amount of fertilizer that your system is basically losing. Um, then, right away, um, Reservoirs really only have a lifespan of about 100 years. 
depending on the river, you know, it, it's different. But generally what we see is most of the rivers here around the Midwest have enough sediment such that they um, are continuously filling up the reservoirs with sediment. And so this is what's happening to this reservoir where upstream, you know, the upstream end of the reservoir here is just filling in with dirt that the stream is bringing in. And we can't stop that, right? We can, we need to, the, the river just nor naturally has some amount of uh, sediment in it. And if it's high enough, it can fill up the entire reservoir and that might fill up within 50 to 100 years. So you might ask, well, what about dredging? Dredging is extremely expensive. This is some numbers from um, uh, from Kansas, and we see, because they're one of the biggest states that has this um, uh, sedimentation problem in the reservoirs. Um, there, you know, on average, it costs to like fully dredge out a, um, a reservoir and take about a million dollars, and then you need to put that sediment somewhere that's toxic. We've kind of talked about that already. You need to contain that sediment. Don't let it get back into the river again. And um, just for one average um, reservoir in Kansas, it would, um, to just keep even, you know, with the amount of dredging, it would cost the state about $800,000 a year per reservoir to be able to keep, you know, the amount of sediment, to keep the stream from, from filling up. So economically, are, there are some good things. There are some bad things. Um, probably economically, it's a net slight positive until you think about um, if the dam were to break we're a, a catastrophic failure right so there's been some you know uh, big time dams that have uh, broken in 1976 they made the Teton dam um, it actually before the reservoir even all the way filled up the dam broke they built it on uh, geologically unstable ground and um, it cost $100 million to build, but by 1978, um, they, uh, the dam broke and the U.S. government had to pay um, $300 million in uh, damages, but that was just a drop in the bucket compared to the $2 billion in damages that the local people had to pay. Um, this took out a whole town. Quite a few people died in this, this accident. The Delhi Dam in Iowa is more recently, um, you know, this is um, just a big thunderstorm came through and it cost $16 million to replace the dam, $5 million was paid by the state, $3 million was paid by the county, and then $8 million was um, made by the local property owners. So this is a common thing that we see where um, dams are... Uh, publicly funded but when they break then it's up to the local people to pay the money uh, to fix their own property and deal with the damage so um, are dams economically profitable that is uh, you know an open question that you know I'm not gonna say for all dams that they're not right some dams do make money for the local area that is that is good right there's plenty of recreational opportunities that reservoirs create um, um, on top of all of these things that we've been talking about. So I'm not going to say dams are all bad economically. What I will say is that ecologically, dams are bad, 100%. No doubt that um, the it, it hurts the ecological, uh, the ecosystem, right? Rivers, pretty much any dam creates clear water coming out with no very little sediment. So the rivers generally oftentimes will degrade. It can alter the hydrology, right? When we're holding a bunch of water and releasing during a flood time and releasing it slowly over time, that is definitely changing the discharge patterns, the flow regime of the river, and the organisms are not used to that. Then the temperature might change, right? So in a reservoir you have a stratified system if, if the river comes from the bottom, right, or if the, um, the outflow of the, the reservoir comes from the bottom, it might be letting out water that has absolutely no oxygen. So it might be cold, but no oxygen for the organisms that live in there. If it's super warm, it might have a lot of oxygen, but not enough for things like trout. So if this is a trout stream, it's 
this trout are going to die. So the, you know, how the temperature or how the water itself is let out here is, is pretty tricky. Um, dams, as you can imagine, are huge migration barriers, right? Uh, now a lot of people say, well, you can make a fish ladder, right? That's what this structure is here. That's what this structure is here, so on a little smaller scale. It's little places where the, the fish themselves can like jump and, you know, the little salmon can jump over the top and into the, each of these little pools and essentially make it up. It's little stair steps up over the river. Um, and yes, fish ladders are okay for some fish. But not all fish can use them. So paddlefish, these super cool, super huge fish, really fun to catch, uh, delicious fish to eat. But they will avoid all dams because their their nose here is um, how it works is it picks up electrical fields and um, they are able to de uh, detect where zooplankton are living based on the little electrical fields of their their muscles are creating. It's pretty crazy how it does it but dams completely screw with that and it doesn't allow, um, the, the paddlefish will avoid dams at all costs. So what we actually see now is most of the spawning of paddlefish across the whole entire US is really done artificial, where the DNR are going out, shocking paddlefish, catching paddlefish, and squeezing out their eggs, squeezing out the sperm from the males, and then um, broadcasting those eggs or growing those eggs up in a uh, in a lab and then broadcasting those eggs later on as little tiny fish fry to support the population. Um, check for a unique solution to this migration barrier um, by this salmon cannon video. Um, watch the first minute and a half or so. It's pretty cool, pretty funny. Check it out. Um, one other impact that we're seeing, uh, humans really create a big uh, really alter streams is for by channelization. Okay, when you deepen a stream, when you um, make the channel straighter, remove all the woody debris, it does drain the land quickly, and it does uh, help avoid floods. So if you can get water out faster, it's less likely that the river itself will flood. Uh, the problem is, is that when you channelize and put these levees on it, you're gonna really overtop those levees at one time or another. So oftentimes what they'll do is they'll build levees and then build towns or things right next to the river and just depend on this levee to hold. And what we know is that, um, the, so the Mississippi River used to flood 80 miles wide back in the early 1900s and, and beforehand. Um, and these floods, you know, I don't care how big and how robust you make those levees, there's never going to be a levee big enough to stop a flood of 80 miles of water coming down the Mississippi River, right? And when we think of climate change, one of the biggest impacts of climate change is that uh, precipitation will come less frequent, but um, more extreme events. So the total amount of precipitation might stay the same, but it'll be compacted into extreme events. And what that means is you're gonna have bigger floods that are more unpredictable. And it's gonna just overtop um, levees more often causing catastrophic damage like this farm here that obviously has some big problems. So what are the one, what's one thing that we could do? Essentially, rather than having levees right along the edge of the stream, why don't you move them back a little bit? Okay, so that's the example here, where we have used to have a levee right along the stream, so you could, it could flood up to here. But now, put the levee a mile, maybe two miles, back from the system. So you're essentially sacrificing this land. This land is going to be flooded eventually, right? And, but that's okay, because you just don't use that land. Um, and then there's a whole lot of water capacity then that this river system has. Um, and it, the, the probability of that, those levees overtopping, um, is really, really low then. And what, it, what this um, does is allows some contact of the floodplain, so that the river can use its floodplain occasionally. 
Um, what this does is it increases the amount of nitrogen that will be remineralized, basically um, going from ammonia and nitrates back into nit nitrogen gas and allow letting less nitrogen get into the Gulf of Mexico and reducing their um, the dead zone problems. Uh, another way to think about levees is to be only protecting cities, right? So, you know, you have a city here, only protect the levees around, put levees around the cities if it's close to the river, and let the farmland flood. But then farmers get upset because they want their land protected, um, even though the river itself is probably helping out their farmland to begin with. What we see, though, is we're kind of in a state where... Um, it's extremely expensive now. We've already put levees along pretty much every major river. So per river mile, and this is for a small stream, not a big stream, it's extremely expensive to um, fix the river or make it go back to, um, to um, a more pristine state. Um, there, we would have to have trillions of dollars spent on those rivers and people are just pretty much not willing to spend that at this time. So when we think about climate change, it's a, a tricky issue. There's so many things to talk about. Um, what I want to say though is we're not really going to see a change in how much precipitation we get, but it's going to be less frequent more unpredictable and higher intensity okay so dams and levees are going to get hit hard and as we're um, you know as we get more and more um, a warmer planet we're going to get more floods but well maybe not necessarily more floods but fewer floods that are higher in intensity and that's going to destroy a lot of the infrastructure that we have or at least make it more expensive to maintain. Um, think about another scenario where, um, let's say we have a fish living in the Missouri or Mississippi River basin here, um, and it lives right here in the Arkansas and the Red River. Let's say that there's a temperature line below which it can't live. So you think what's going to happen in um, a climate change scenario is as we get warmer, that line is going to go up, right? And it might completely eliminate this Red River population. What does that mean for the Arkansas River? Well, they're pretty much isolated. How does this Arkansas River fish get up into the Platte River? Maybe because that's the next big river up north. Well, it would need to go down into this red zone and swim all the way around to get back to the Platte River. Well, first off, we don't know what the Mississippi River is like. Maybe that's not okay for this tiny little fish here. Um, and it's definitely not going to be, be, it's going to be too warm for it in this section. So depending on how rivers are oriented on the continent, it's not like they can just, oh, well, the fish can just swim up north, especially when, you know, there's those, those river courses don't really allow them to go up north. 